Let's now take a look at combining histograms and box plots to look at variation. We already know that histograms are definitely one way to visualize variation in a quantitative or in a continuous variable and box plots of course are also good for that purpose. Now what we'd like to do is to put together both of these things. Okay, So this first plot generates a histogram. So ggplot mpg and for a histogram you need to map only the x aesthetic. You don't need to map the y aesthetic and because the y is always a count in a histogram so there's no problem and we say geom histogram. Now the reason I'm assigning this to a variable called a is that I'm going to be using the variable later because we are trying to put together histograms and box plots. Okay and similarly I create the box plot with this code that we just used in the previous slide. Notice that we had to map both x and y because that's the way it works. Okay and we want the box plot to be flipped around because I, what I want to do is to look at them bottom and top okay top and bottom with the one on the top and the other in the bottom and if the uh, box plot is flipped around like this then it makes sense for comparison so that's why I flipped it around now what we want to do is to put both of these together into a single plot in order to combine both of these into a single plot we will be installing a new package called grid extra so install dot packages grid extra spelled exactly like this lowercase g and uppercase e okay now ggplot itself doesn't have the capability to take two different plots and combine them into a single plot so somebody wrote a package called grid extra so install dot packages grid extra library grid extra and then now that we've got the grid extra package loaded it's a simple matter to combine two plots into one so there's a function called grid dot arrange inside this package grid extra so all we have to do is to say grid dot arrange and then put in the plots that we want to combine it doesn't have to be two it could be several so a comma b comma c comma d whatever it is in this case we've got a and b the two that we plotted earlier a is our histogram and b is our box plot and here we have the options of saying how many columns how many rows etc so here i'm just saying n call equals one because i want the histogram and the box plot to appear one on top of the other so that's what you get okay so these are two separate ggplot plots that grid extra has combined into one plot for us okay so this makes it easy for us to uh, look at the distribution in two different ways simultaneously okay so you can look at the box plot which of course shows us the median here it shows us the minimum maximum and the outliers right it's got all of that and then of course we get a more detailed view of the same thing with the histogram so both histograms and box plots show us the distribution of a variable so let's see how they compare against each other right so that's our previous plot with the histogram on top and the box plot at the bottom and we can roughly see the correspondence between the two of them right so first of all we can see that the bar stretches on the same range of course the range is the same on the x-axis for both of them and we can also see that uh, the outliers also map so you can generally see the correspondence between these two uh, but of course there are some differences as well right so, so the first point is that there is multimodality in the in the distribution of this data the histogram makes it obvious that there is multimodality by that we mean one maximum and another maximum it's not a bell shape it's rather two sort of bell shapes and within the box plot that multimodality is completely not visible at all okay so the histogram is generally better in giving us an idea of the variation okay but the advantage of the box plot is that the box plot makes the median completely explicit okay with the histogram you cannot readily make out what the median is okay which means that you have to sort of be able to figure out where 50 percent of the values are falling and that's not easy just by looking at the histogram but the box plot makes that easy similarly the box plot also makes it easy for us to see where the 25th percentile is where the 75th percentile is all of that are easy uh, those things are easy to see with the box plot not so with the histogram again with the hist with the box plot we don't see any detail in this region at all okay whereas in the histogram you you're able to see detail throughout the entire range 
Okay, so the detail is available for the entire range with the histogram. And box plot, as I said earlier, doesn't provide any detail. Okay, so each provide has its own advantages. The box plot is very good in that it captures uh, the variability in the data, variation in the data, and shows it to us by means of just five different numbers. Okay, it's showing us basically one number here, one here, one here, one here, uh, and one here. Okay, so three plus two, five numbers, and you're getting a complete idea of the distribution. It also explicitly shows us where the outliers are. Okay, that's the advantage of the box plot, that it's a very simple one to interpret. There's not too much detail, you get an idea. Histogram is more strong when it comes to showing us much more detail in how the data is distributed. Okay, now given that each has its own advantages, might be a good idea for us to just look at both overlay both just as I have shown here and then get all the insights from one plot. Let us look at an alternative to a histogram. What we are going to look at is very similar to a histogram but it has some advantages in certain situations. Okay, So once again we do our uh, basic mapping of the data and uh, uh, setting of the data and mapping of the required uh, characteristics and then we plot a histogram and the histogram comes out like this as we expected no surprise but we have an option you can do a freak poly it's a frequency polygon okay and it'll look like this now the information that it contains is almost exactly identical to that of a histogram in fact geom freak poly also does the binning exactly the way histogram does and the default number of bins is still 30 you will see that when you plot the data okay so that's what this is and all you're seeing really is that instead of bars it shows you one line and really speaking as we will shortly see each point of the line is re really the middle of the top of each of the bars that's what is going on actually okay so this is just the same as before I don't know why it got repeated and you can do some fun things uh, here what I've done is I've just tried to show you the relationship between the histogram and the frequency polygon by of course overlaying them one on top of the other. I changed the fill color of the uh, histogram just so that the line of the frequency polygon is more easily visible. Okay, So from this because we were able to drop both the layers one on top of the other you're clearly able to see that uh, the frequency polygon you see that it's going through the middle of each of the bars okay which means there is a bar here at level close to zero there's another bar here which is also close to zero so it's going to the middle of each bar and that's what's going on okay so really there is a complete one-to-one -one correspondence between the frequency polygon and the histogram we'll see that the frequency polygon is sometimes a little more useful than a histogram especially when we are doing uh, when we are trying to further subdivide the bars within the histogram. You can control the bin width of, of the frequency polygon, okay, which is basically the width of the bin. It's sort of like the width of the bar in a histogram. So obviously, the smaller the bin width is, the more detail you see, the larger the bin width is, the more gross it appears. Just like we did with histograms, it is possible for us to segment these peaks to show the comp further uh, detailed composition of each of the peaks. So we could do something like this. So we've got the aesthetics uh, displacement is mapped to the x-axis and this time we say color equals drive. See after all unlike a histogram where you've got two things. You've got the color which is basically the outline of each of the bars and then you've got the fill which is the actual color of the bar itself. With uh, frequency polygons you have color which is the color of the line that represents the frequency polygon okay so that's what we are mapping to and of course therefore we'll see different frequency polygons for cars of different car, different drives that's what we are seeing here right so there are three drives four wheel front wheel rear wheel and we are seeing one frequency polygon for each of those let's look at faceting of histograms once again so here we are creating again a histogram of displacements and the fill color is going to be based on the drive of a vehicle 
we have done this before I suppose and we are saying geom histogram and this time we are choosing a specific bin width. Now one thing you might have noticed earlier when you did histograms if you did not specify anything about the binning then it chooses ggplot chooses 30 bins by default and it tells you please go and choose a better value. Okay, So here we are saying I don't want 30 bins. 30 bins is probably a little too much for the range of displacement values we have. So instead I'm saying make the, dis, uh, the bin width as 0.5 of the x-axis. Okay, So that's what the bin width is and uh, we are doing a facet trap again by drive itself and I'm doing that deliberately to illustrate a certain point and I'm saying n call equals 1 so we're going to get one column of plots and the result of course is to be something like this that's what we expect <coughs> okay and so we have three different plots three different facets if you like with uh, one each for the different kinds of drive rear wheel front wheel four wheel and this is a good illustration of how faceting by some secondary characteristic shows you certain interesting aspects of the data right so we are looking at the distribution of displacement and it turns out that rear wheel car rear wheel drive cars seem to generally have displacements in the higher end of the range and four wheel drives seem to have a good dispersion and front wheel drives generally tend seem to have uh, on the lower side of displacement okay that is something which would obviously not have been evident if we had looked at just one histogram and this is why sometimes they talk about uh, essentially data analysis or statistics as just a study of variation right so here we are looking at the variation of the distribution of displacements across cars of different drives okay and that gives us some uh, interesting in insight into what is going on okay so that's anyway the main point of this particular graph was to illustrate something else right so we chose the fill color to be the drive of the vehicle but the fill color is actually quite redundant right because after all when you look at the different plots you already know that each plot is for a different kind of drive right so adding in the color is not really giving us any additional information it might make it look a little pretty but it's not giving any additional information right and therefore this legend is really overkill we don't need this legend at all here okay now in fact some people some purists of data visualization so for example if you go and look at uh, the books written by Edward Tufte or look at some videos that you might find of Edward Tufte talking about data visualization they say don't try to put anything extraneous in your plots right so for example here we have added color the color is not really adding any additional information for us right so the point the reason why they say don't add anything extraneous is that when you see that something is different your mind tries to go and make sense of that difference okay and therefore it places a cognitive load right so in fact sometimes they call extraneous things that are put on top of plots as chart junk so the guideline that Trufty says is avoid chart junk so in this case you may say well the color is not really detracting too much from the meaning of the data and it does make it look pretty let's admit it but definitely the legend here is chart junk it's not adding any additional information and we really don't need to know what the color means at all because the plot each plot is telling us what it is right so therefore there is a case to be made for getting rid of that legend altogether while still retaining the facets of course okay so what we are going to do is to show you how to get rid of the legend the le so there is this function called theme right so with theme you can control a lot of things and we'll have a special uh, separate lecture talking about the various things you can control with theme but here I'm just showing you how it might be used so that you have an idea of how these things are controlled okay so we are saying theme legend dot position equals none okay so that in fact tells us that you can control the position of the legend now by default the legend has always appeared on the right of the plot for us okay and we have simply taken it for granted so far but you have a choice of where to actually place the legend if you want the legend at the bottom or top or left you can do that and of course if you want to completely get rid of the legend you can do that as well now this option of simply getting rid of all legends is sometimes useful as in this example but many times we would like finer control over the legends to get rid of so for example we may want to get rid of some of the legends while retaining the others or we may want to get rid of the legends for specific layers 
and keep the other layers untouched. So let's see, see two examples here. So here we are just doing a frequency polygon. It doesn't really matter what we are doing here. The point is, look at the call guides fill equals none. A fill equals false. Okay. So what this does is that it removes the legend for all fill aesthetics. Right. So wherever we may have mapped fill to something, those legends will not appear in the plot. Okay. Now it is possible that there are several layers in which we have used the fill color aspect. What this will do is not show the fill uh, legend at all. Okay. So this is getting rid of legends associated with specific aesthetics. Now sometimes we may want to get rid of the legends for specific layers. Okay. So that's what you're doing here. So here we are saying for this layer alone, don't show the legend. Okay. For this layer alone, don't show the legend. But for other layers, show the legend. Okay. So for this layer, it won't show any legends. We may have mapped several aesthetics. So for example, we may have mapped the line color or the line type. None of those legends will show up. Okay. Now, of course, I'm not saying that you should always be getting rid of legends. Now, most of the time, we don't want to get rid of legends. We want to show the legends because we have mapped them for a certain purpose. But it is possible that sometimes what you're saying is so obvious that adding additional stuff on the plot might only be distracting for the viewer. So you want to selectively get rid of the legends. You have the option of either getting rid of the legends for a particular aesthetic or getting rid of the legends for a particular layer or getting rid of all legends altogether. All of those options are available. I just wanted to give you a small sampling of what is possible. So a broader thing to talk about is many times we ask a question, I want to achieve this, can ggplot do it? Okay. So most of the time, 99.9% .9 of the time, the answer will be yes, it can be done. So the question is not, can it be done? The question is more like, how can I achieve something? Right. And once you have that question clearly formulated, finding an answer is just one Google search away. Do a search and you'll find several excellent answers to your question. Provided, of course, what you're trying to do makes sense. In fact, there might be some answers that even come back telling you why what you're asking doesn't even make sense. That is also possible. Okay. So many times the problem is not with the tool. It's not with understanding ggplot very well. At this point, I think you already understand the important aspects of ggplot, its underlying philosophy. You understand that very well at this point. So the point is for us to be asking the right questions, right? So point is to say, I want to get a plot which looks like this. Okay. Once you have formulated the question, you can always find the answer. Right. So having a great amount of facility with ggplot by itself is not very useful, but having a good understanding of ggplot the way you have now and then being able to ask the right questions is more important. Okay. So once you have a base level knowledge of ggplot, then the attention really has to shift over to asking good questions. So uh, as we go forward in the course, we will start delving into that about what kind of questions can we ask of a given data set.